Print out the agenda. What's that? I don't want to print out the agenda. Oh, no, that makes sense. Um, no, that won't do it. You have to do our... We have the review and approve minutes of October 2nd, 2013. Dang. <coughs> of October 2nd, 2013. We have a second. 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 Any discussion or notations? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. <coughs> and financial statement. Good we have tonight the October uh, report, and we have a couple of variances. On page two, you'll see that Nature's Classroom is over by $687.97, and that was due mostly to the new contracted change we have in the teacher's contract where the teacher stipends went from $50 today to $100 a day. Also on page two, our computer registers are over by $1,205. Um, this was because we moved from a standalone server in each school to cloud computing, so we have to pay that fee every year now. Um, that's for our Redeker student database, but the cloud gives us a lot more access, especially to the principal and the assistant principal. They can access that from any device, from anywhere, and it also is uh, better for the district to compile district reports. On page three, we have two small uh, variances. Our psychological supplies, our psychologist supplies, uh, went over by 48.14, and our nursing supplies went over 37.06. Uh, so we have small variances there. Um, I also wanted to let you know that uh, we our, our bus contract ends this year in June. So uh, we went out with the Franklin County uh, Schools and we went out for a joint bid. That will be awarded on November 19th at the Franklin County Technical School at 11 a.m. Uh, and so we will be bringing that to you next month for award. We have eight warrants tonight. Uh, one, um, the fiscal agent payroll for October, the monthly expenditures, a school lunch warrant, uh, full day preschool expenses, day break expenses, school choice, which is mainly our tuitions, and after school, and we did get a progress billing for the doors, uh, which will be paid from the capital projects budget. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Does that mean the doors are in process by progress? Next week. Yep, we're going to start hopefully the Friday we're looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> The, the computer register is just a one-time charge. No, for that'll or? be it'll be every year because we, right. it, it's sort of we're renting a server now instead right. of having a separate server in each school. So mm -hmm. we will adjust the budget going forward to make sure that we um, accommodate for that charge. Okay. And public comment. Yeah. Just the flat public. Finished business. Nothing to discuss or vote on. New business budget timelines. <clears throat> you have before you the budget timelines for this year. Um, you will be getting your uh, budget books. They'll be distributed in December. Um, we've met several times as uh, principals uh, together and with Patty and with. Um, Scott Paul and Bob Lesko uh, and Karen Ferrandino to go over um, expectations. It's always lovely to try to predict your budget a year in advance, but, but that's what we're doing. So, um, so I just wanted you to have a, a sense of, um, of where we are in that, that process. Are we going to keep going on the next item? Or? Sure. Uh, last month, I brought to you a draft plan for a school emergency evacuation plan, and I said that I would 
be bringing it back to the principals for any feedback. The only feedback I got was to make sure there was a little bit more detail. That was included in your email packets um, about um, identifying the bus companies and phone numbers. So um, I'm bringing it to you now because I've distributed it to all of the school committees. It's the same one, that you re if you can't put your fingers on it, it's the same one that you had last month. It just has um, the phone numbers of the bus companies listed. That's the only change. I just timelines. There's nothing new or different about it this year. You just I'm just providing you with the information. Okay. Yeah. No yeah. major changes. No major changes. Right. So the primary change in the evacuation plan is the addition of the Just, phone numbers. Yeah, the addition of the names and phone numbers. Mm -hmm. And again, this is so if it was a <coughs> catastrophic event, an event with a railroad or um, a spill on 91 or something mm -hmm. um, to that nature. And do you do you assemble a crisis team? Yeah, each of the schools has a crisis team and then we spell it out in here. Right. Um, who, who's the point person, who's the person contacting the police, who's the person contacting the bus company, who's the person contacting, dealing with the public, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. So, I just think it's good to, to revisit a lot of safety and evacuation plans. Obviously, we, you know, hope for the best and prepare for the worst, but um, so, you know, I periodically will be bringing you updates on, on safety mm -hmm. issues. Okay. Any other questions on the evacuation plan? Rolling along. The calendar. Change current conference days. This we are bringing to all the school committees. Um, so what had happened is, as you know, we went from three conference days um, in the spring last year to two conference days in the spring this year with the caveat that parents um, could request a conference with their child's teacher if the information on the report card um, warranted that. And so that not everyone needed to have a, a second parent conference. And I believe, I wasn't here for that, but I believe part of the reason for going to two days was um, for that very reason, that it wouldn't be the same number who had conferences in the fall. Having said that, they chose two dates that unfortunately um, that report card will not even have been issued. So if we're telling parents, please make an appointment with your child's teacher if you have concerns based on the report card, they should have their report card. So um, the report cards will be given out in the early part of April. So the request, and also this conflicts with MCAS testing, and frankly in some schools, park testing. Um, so we just thought it was too much and this would ease the burden and make it more meaningful for everyone if we switched the conference days to April 10th and 11th. So the other elementary school that I brought it to is Waitley. Um, you are the second and then next week I have Sunderland and Conway. So Waitley approved it. And so that's what I'm asking for your approval. And I'm kind of looking to the teachers who were here. Is that your understanding? Okay, no. Okay, okay. But the, the conferences were to be reduced from three to two because it wasn't going to be 100. They were reduced last year. They were, okay. okay. Yeah. My understanding that last year it was generated from another town whose population felt that three days was not necessary. Okay, okay. But I think it's important if you're asking parents to schedule a conference that they have their report cards in front of them. Sure. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess we'll find out if two days is enough. I guess so. <clears throat> There's a nice um, debate in New York Times today. 
and I was interested about is the parent teacher conference worth it or not? Mm. Not really. I didn't have time to read it. But. <laughs> <laughs> but, one of those, you know, so, yeah. hey, that's a, multiple uh, contributors. To sounds like the point. room for debate. Literally, the headline is something as direct as okay. uh, parent teacher. Maybe they can get it by a text message instead. Hey. <laughs> Personally, I think it's worth it. What's that? Sometimes conference calls happen. Mm -hmm. Communication. Um, so I would entertain a motion to amend Union 38 school calendar to change current conference days from March 20th and 21st to April 10th and 11th, 2014. Right. Oh, it's just coming important. sooner than you That's think. Right. Oh, yeah. It is 2014. Right. It says 2013. Okay. I think it's past Jamie. No, it wasn't. It was Ken. Oh. It was Ken. Oh. Yeah. What's that? I thought that was Jamie who said that. Was the correction? No, no, I was just uh, okay. entertaining a motion. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Your calendar has been amended in two Thank counts you. now. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you. And in November 5th in service events. Yeah, we, as you know, we had uh, a full day in service last week, last Tuesday on voting day, and included in your agenda was the, um, were all the events the teachers had an opportunity to participate. And I'm bringing to your attention because, um, it, you know, as I've said to the other school committees, I think sometimes we have a tendency to look outside um, our own district for expertise when we really need to be looking more within because we have so much expertise within this district. So I give a lot of kudos to Louise Law and um, Sarah Mitchell for organizing this. They contacted um, teachers from all over the district and many of the <coughs> elementary were paired with secondary teachers. I really like that model. Um, and and I, you know, the feedback, we were reviewing it today in the principals meeting, uh, the surveys that were sent out, the amount of satisfaction, especially from the morning activities, was extremely high. Uh, the other thing I like to point out to school committees is it cost us almost nothing. Uh, oftentimes you'll get a speaker from, you know, hundreds of miles away and, and have to spend thousands of dollars, and I think this was much more rewarding. Um, so I just thought it was worth bringing it to your attention and having you take a look at some of the variety of, of uh, workshops that were presented. <clears throat> Certainly looks like a busy day. Were all workshops attended? There was only one that had um, less than three in it that had to be canceled. So yes, many of them um, were extremely well attended. Great. <clears throat> Trends. I believe, David, it was yeah, you four. last meeting, I believe it was you, who had asked to look at. Mm -hmm. So I've probably provided you with more data than you would care to have. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think it's worth taking a look at. The first sheet gives your resident student enrollment and it's pre-K through 12. And then at the bottom has the school choice enrollment. And this is from 2004 to 2013. So you can get a sense of what our, our numbers are looking like. Um, some towns obviously have, have more school choice than others. Um, some budgets rely more on the school choice dollars than others. And then behind it, <coughs> I've given you all of the school's um, enrollment from 2004 to 2013 so that you can take a look at those enrollments, K through 6, to see how we're faring as a district. Um, and then I did another one of uh, pre-K through uh, grade 12, and that's for 2009 through 2013. And then I did a very lengthy history from 1980 
to the present because I think you need to put things in perspective. Um, yeah. Things have a, a way of going, uh, ebbing and flowing. And um, I also wanted to point out that school choice was fairly uh, uh, non-existent prior to 2002. So when you're looking at these numbers, if you're looking at enrollments prior to 2002, what you're seeing are resident enrollments as compared to, to, to now. So it's a lot of information to absorb. Um, but take a look at it. Um, the other piece, too, that we're a member of NESDEC, and we were able to send them a lot of information at the beginning of the year. And what they're going to give us is uh, predictability for future trends using birth rates mm -hmm. and census data. So um, I should be getting it fairly soon because I think that's you know that's worth looking at when we were talking last night you know I said I can only speak <coughs> to Deerfield but um, there are very few building permits going on um, what I don't know is the aging population if you know if they're moving out and younger families are moving in um, but we're certainly not seeing any major growth trends that I can can see in Deerfield, and I haven't seen those uh, in the other towns as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, that's I, what I have. you know, my my reason for asking was mm -hmm. partly because of what I'm experiencing at the school I work mm -hmm. at, but also because it strikes me that we're and you are we, you can see the erosion mm -hmm. um, over the last four or five years. Um, so, <clears throat> so, going to be definitely bear watching. Definitely bears watching. Most of our school <coughs> choice students do not, uh, most of our school choice students who start in our elementary <coughs> schools continue through 7th through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. The middle and high school get very few new school choice students, and by that I mean about five. Mm -hmm. Um, so even though Frontier has 129 school choice students, those are coming up from the elementary school, the majority of them. So. Do we have any data on the number of kids we lose from six to seven? We, we have, and it's been pretty constant, Jamie, um, for the last couple of years. Most of the ones that we lose from 6th to 7th are going to uh, private schools. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very personal you know, family choice, and, mm -hmm. and often families know that from the get-go. And that's been a, a pretty steady number. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few students, and, and by that probably less than five, um, who are choosing charter. Um, very few choose to choice out after that, and it's often for a very particular reason. A parent's job, um, something along those lines. But we're not seeing any, any exodus. Um, the technical school from 8th to ninth grade uh, that number fluctuates every year, and I think this year there's only about 10 going, whereas the year before there were about 18. So that um, is dependent upon the number of applications to the tech school. And then there's just in the in the um, in the data columns, there's a couple of doubling, so in the Conway and Deerfield page, there's two 2009s and no 2010. Um, it's not a big deal, but it, it's no, I just wanted to make a note of it. Um, and then on the Sunland page, oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, you get, on Sunland page, well, on the Sunland table, there's two 2009s, and then on the Whaley table, it goes 07, 08, 09, 08, 11, 12. I just noticed that. And they're not the just typos at the top. They're they're no, the that, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Okay. 
we can make that correction. Yeah, somehow they duplicated, and I don't know why. Yeah. And you're, this is the third committee, and I, you're the first one who's pointed them out. <laughs> the grading eye. I think it, it sort of, not sort of, it, to me, it underscores the importance of school choice to our union or region when 20%, 25% of the students in the region are school choice students. Um, if we didn't have them, compared to, you said around 2002 is when school choice right. started, when we had close to 1,600 students mm -hmm. from the, our towns, we'd have about, what, 1,200? 1150 students right now in our schools. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's uh, mm. pretty eye opening if you think of it in those terms. Right, <clears throat> it is. Yeah. So, it certainly serves to emphasize what we've been experiencing, I think, across the, uh, across the area, across the country. In terms of schools, so, enrollments are down. <clears throat> so I think it bears watching, you know, I think it bears paying attention to the data. Um, I used to joke at Frontier that if school choice were the name of a town, it would be the largest sending town of the four. Mm -hmm. um, because that was where most of the kids came from. Other thoughts or comments? Okay. Okay. Thank you for putting those together. You're welcome, and I'll correct those columns. I don't know why that duplicated that way. So, we are down to reports. Just a quick question. Sorry, slightly related. When was Frontier built? Nineteen. Well, they started in '96. The construction was complete in '98. Okay, so these are all. Yeah, yeah. And it was built when it was originally um, proposed. I mean, the capacity. They thought it would be over a thousand students okay. now. Yeah. when we built this school, we were projecting over 600 students. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. That was I the cannot see room for that. 20, 25 we're, years ago. We're bursting at the seams right now. That was the, uh, well, there were a lot yeah. fewer programs back then. Specialized but, programs. Um, right. Well, they take a lot of sizes, too. And there's, you know, there was provision for an addition if it was going to be needed. And, mm -hmm. All sorts of things. You wouldn't have any play space left, but you'd have an addition. So, uh, but that that was what the capacity wow. was, and that's what they predicted based upon the birth rate and wow. and all enrollment of the trends. trends. At, yeah, all of the trends at that point in time, 20, 20 plus twenty five years ago, yeah. pointed towards it. Yeah. <laughs> Just kind of underscores that we have to look at these numbers and look at the trends, but realize trends don't always play out as you right. Right. Kind of, right. Absolutely. they can be a trap. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we could see, we could think, oh, we're trending downwards, we got to start planning that way, and then something happens in another part of the Commonwealth, and all of a sudden Western Mass looks mighty good to a bunch mm -hmm. of people when they move here. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, trends are educated guesses at best. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, but it's certainly worth taking a long head look. Yes. So, what were your principal's report? Okay. Um, you should have a copy of this month's principal's report. Just a couple of things I wanted to highlight. Um, writing instruction. So one of the district's initiatives this year is to really focus on a writer's workshop approach um, in the classroom, K-6. And we even have our um, full day preschool. They wanted to kind of jump in on that. And they're actually doing writing in our preschool. 
mm-hmm. if you can imagine. Mm-hmm. So you know, starting with storytelling and that kind of thing. But uh, and if you saw from the offerings from the November fifth in service, there were many. Um, workshop breakout sessions that focused on writing instruction but what it looks like on a day-to-day basis when you walk through the hallways what we're seeing you you would enter um, a classroom and you're seeing students writing independently you're seeing teachers conferencing um, with either small groups or individual students um, you would see a teacher doing a short mini lesson about 10 to 12 minutes the beginning kids go off and write independently and they come back and they share But the other piece that I'm really enjoying when I'm walking in classrooms is that we're here in common language now, which was one of the goals to having this district-wide initiative. And it helps students as they move from grade level to grade level. We're also seeing a lot of charts that are in classrooms that students are using as resources to help them when they're composing personal narratives or um, talking about watermelon stories and seed stories and language that they're hearing on a day-to-day basis. Um, sitting in and talking to teachers we're just even though we're in the middle of November it's so impressive to see the rigor the volume of writing in students writing folders already at this point in the year and the growth they're making so it's a very powerful program that comes from teachers college um, out in New York City and um, teachers it's not easy to do um, what I can say, you know, from an education perspective, it's a very difficult and rigorous program, and the time that teachers have to put into planning, into reading about it, and to um, figuring out a teaching point at, at a moment's notice, sitting next to a student, it's a very, very difficult program to teach. And our teachers are working very hard to do this, and they're working collaboratively. Uh, in teams and we're already seeing the difference so I'm thrilled I can't wait to see where we are in June um, and what what our students are doing so um, it's good stuff really good stuff Um, the other piece I wanted to talk about was a math workshop approach I'm glad Kayla's here because she's kind of um, been involved in that with Meg Schulder our math interventionist and you know it's a very different approach to teaching math so when you walk into a classroom, what you would see is, and we brought Meg on as our math interventionist, this is her third year now in this role, um, team teaching. So you're seeing true parallel teaching at its best. You'd walk into a classroom, Kayla might be working with a small group of students, Meg Schulte's working with a small group of students. They're doing um, direct instruction. And then other students could be working either in pairs or working independently, and they're rotating. So they're shifting from one teacher to the next, but they're really getting targeted direct instruction. And then there's time for independent um, work as well. But um, it's really impressive. And when you walk into a classroom, the, the noise level, it's just this perfect little hum of students working. I don't know if, Kayla, if you want to add any comments to that or... Great. Yeah. I mean, if I just ask Meg, it would be very difficult to do, but having the resources of Meg, and I have an instructional assistant this year, so it's been, you know, it's been great for my room, but I do think it would be to implement another classes yeah, she's, and how the resources. It, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's impressive to watch. Meg's doing it with other teachers as well. Um, but it's something that's definitely been a, a very effective approach to teaching math and a different one. So um, we certainly have teachers that are thinking out of the box. Um, I listed a couple of school-based activities. We had Eagle Brook Strings. They had asked if they could come over and perform for us. And that was really nice. We had one alumni who was um, actually performing on stage. Um, we also had our Mix It Up Day that's facilitated by sixth grade every year. It's a tradition. And, it, it, you know, I walked into the cafeteria to see, and what happens is, I don't know if anyone has heard about the details of how it's kind of run, but the students, they're, they're eating lunch at a different table. So they are truly mixing it up and meeting new faces and, and new people, but the sixth grade ambassadors are facilitating conversation with dialogue with um, conversation starters at each table. And it was the quietest lunch. <laughs> Those periods were the quietest lunch periods. The cafeteria manager said, can we do this every week? <coughs> but it was really, it was great because the student ambassadors took the, their role so seriously. They were so mature about it. And um, even working with our younger students, but that was a very successful day. And our one of our first um, 
our arts festival day, there was a meeting today, a planning meeting. We were unable to attend. We were tied up at another meeting. But they will be having monthly meetings to plan. Parents were invited to get involved in that. Um, Catherine Rashad, the art teacher, and Janet Ryan, the music teacher, are kind of spearheading it. And the theme this year is Italy. So more to come. And Marty already spoke to the in-service day. I just listed some of the, um, the offerings that were there, but you have the handout. And I had mentioned the new doors, which are coming next week, hopefully with the install date of Friday. But it'll definitely take more than one day. And the other piece that I want to speak to is something that we has sort of become a tradition now in the district. During parent-teacher conference days, the instructional assistants are participating in workshops while the teachers are conferencing. And these workshops followed a similar model to the, our November 5th in service day where our own faculty who are available and not as involved in conferences are facilitating those. And we have a lot of talent, a lot of experts in this district and we're trying to tap those resources. So you can see some of the offerings that were listed there and um, I know Sarah and, and Louise did a survey to get feedback from the IAs and it was very positive as well. So um, we're pleased and we'll continue that in April. So that's all we have. Any questions I can answer? I don't see any. Okay. Ms. Barrett? Well, I've already talked about the first two, <coughs> and um, I'll beat Jamie to the punch. The information is correct, but the heading's wrong. <laughs> I was going to let that one be. I know. Well, I thought, oh. Um, but I did um, just want to follow up. I did my um, goal setting and um, objectives with the Joint School Committee on October 29th. I appreciate <clears throat> those of you who were able to come out for one more night. Um, so I had seven goals that I brought forward and they were approved and I'll do a mid-cycle review again with the committee in February. So um, I knew it was a lot of information and I think it was an hour and a half of me talking straight and I appreciate you putting up with, <coughs> with me on that. Um, last week I did have the opportunity with five other school committee members to go to the Mask Mass Annual um, Conference on the Cape. <clears throat> Got a lot of information about the district <coughs> determined measures, uh, the new park assessment and the retail mandate, um, as well as a lot of information regarding um, funding, um, which is really helpful for a new superintendent. So, you know, there's a lot of new initiatives that are coming down from the state along with the new evaluation document and it often feels like your shoulders can only bear so much new information and new initiatives. So um, I think the powers that be at the state are hearing this from people and are taking um, people's concerns seriously. Um, we were to have a special uh, meeting at uh, Frontier uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. This was to hear the reports from the subcommittee meetings, the long-range planning and the capital improvement. Um, and they felt they needed more time. But um, So we have rescheduled to January 23rd. And the reason I brought it up with you tonight is I did tell them that that's fine and I would rather have thoughtful comments and things that were thrown together hurriedly. But it does mean that we will not be able to impact the budgeting process for this coming year. It'll be for next year. So that's what I have. Unless you have any questions. We are almost on a world record pace here. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's <coughs> noticing in the paper, but the town of Deerfield is, um, has had recommendations made relative to their governance structure and uh, select board and um, suggest strong suggestions made about the town administrator position. And I know that there's a public meeting coming up to discuss those results and, and actions. So I would encourage anyone that has any concerns or any thoughts as to um, Town Hall 
uh, governance to certainly try and attend that session. I, I, I don't have my notes. I think it's on the 20th. Yeah. I think. That's, yeah. You're right. Um, I, I think that what's being recommended is long overdue, but you notice that there's some reluctance on the part of our select board to endorse all the recommendations that have been made. So uh, I just thought I'd point that out in case anyone has nothing to do on the 20th. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, no other business, then I think we're down to <coughs> adjournment. Wow. Yeah. And it's not even a World Series now. I mean, <laughs> so, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. So, then a second. Second. We have a second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Seven people